if you are looking for a place devoid of religion, if you are looking for a place where the gospel is preached raw, if you are looking for a place where you want to know God as your own personal father, if you are looking for a place where transformation happens from the inside out, then I want to welcome you to the lighthouse. I will see you on the inside. God bless you. Hallelujah. 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 Father, we give you praise. Father, we thank you. Father, we bless you. Father, we honor you. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your loving kindness. Thank you for what you are going to do today. Thank you for the impartation of the Holy Ghost. Thank you for the journey that you have taken us through. Lord, we give you praise in the name of Jesus. Lord, I decree and declare that the entrance of your word will give understanding to the simple. This morning in the name of Jesus. Thank you for your blessing. Lord, we give you praise. In Jesus' name, we pray. Today, I bring you a word from the Lord that I believe sincerely will bless you. This is the climax of the story of Joseph that we have been dealing with for the past two or three months. And here, we come to the concluding part of the story of how Joseph became the prime minister. If you remember, the past three weeks, I believe we've been talking about humility, that when Joseph showed up before Pharaoh, Joseph alluded the glory to God. Pharaoh started by saying that I've heard of your fame and that you can interpret any dream. And Joseph said, it is not in me, O Pharaoh, to interpret dreams. It's God that will give, you, give Pharaoh the answer or favorable answer of peace. Now, Pharaoh then, in verse 17, Genesis 41, verse 17, began to explain the dream that he had. He had two dreams. He explained the dreams that he had. I'm not going to go into the, into the detail of the dreams, essentially, but the dreams is talking about the fact that, you know, uh, the concluding part of the dream, essentially, was that there was going to be a seven year of abundance and there was going to be a seven year of drought. All right. That was how Joseph interpreted the dreams. Okay, so but when Pharaoh had the dreams, Pharaoh said in verse 24, he said, I told I told these dreams to magicians and soothsayers in my kingdom, but there was no one who could explain it to me. Okay, and then in verse 28, Joseph explained and said, This is the message, just as I have told Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he's about to do. All right, okay, so then in verse 33, Joseph began to explain to Pharaoh what the dream meant, but also what Pharaoh should do about the dream, the actions that Pharaoh should take to put in place to ensure that even though these dreams cannot be changed, that God is going to do what he has said he's going to do, he can take advantage of what is going to happen. And that is absolutely beautiful. So in verse 33, Joseph said, So now let Pharaoh prepare ahead, prepare ahead, and look for a man discerning and clear-headed and wise and set him in charge over the land of Egypt as governor under Pharaoh. Let Pharaoh take action to appoint overseers and officials over the land and set aside one-fifth of the produce of the entire land of Egypt in the seven years of abundance. Let them gather as a tax all of the fifth of the food of these good years that are coming in, in and start up grain under the direction and authority of Pharaoh and let them guard the food in fortified granaries in the cities. That food shall be in storage as a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine and hunger which will occur in the land of Egypt so that the land and the people will not be ravaged during the famine. Now the verse 7 says, now the plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to all of his servants. Before I continue, I want to express something here. The wisdom that God gave Joseph here. Joseph not only was able to interpret the dreams, but he was able to explain to Pharaoh what he should do. Joseph became an advisor to the king. Not only was he asked, oh, what, is this, what, what does this dream mean? Oh, these dreams meant so, so, and so. That would have been good enough. But Joseph went further. Joseph began to explain to Pharaoh what he should do.
to avert the disaster that is coming. What you should do to take advantage of the blessings that are coming. I hope you understand that. I hope you understand that the ask from for jo, from the ask of Pharaoh from Joseph was not to give solutions. The ask of Pharaoh from Joseph was to interpret the dreams. Tell me what it means. So that I can then sit down and think about how to solve the problem. But Joseph went a step further. He interpreted the dreams, did what he was asked to do, but then began to explain this is actually an action plan that you can put in place to make this a reality. That is profound. So if it is in your schoolwork or in your workplace or in any place where you find yourself, do you know how you can differentiate yourself from the rest of the park? Is by adding value. Suppose two people go to, for an interview and somebody gave just the, right, the normal answer that everybody else would give. But somebody goes ahead for that and say, actually, this is how I'm going to solve the problem. This is what you do, this is what you do, this is what you do, this is what you do. Do you think, do you not know that the person who gave a detailed explanation of the action plan on how that is going to be resolved will get a job compared to the person who just gave the standard book answer that everybody gives? I remember there was a job that when I told God, I, I was putting my children in, in the private school, I didn't have the money, but you know, I just believed God. I began to call for the money that I needed. And within 30 days, I got this interview that doubled my salary. And within 30 days, I had a salary that got doubled, right? But let me tell you something that happened at the interview. When I was going for that interview, I was so afraid. And I, in, in, my, in, in, in the carriage where I sat, where I was in the train, I saw a vision of Jesus sitting across from the other side. He was smiling. He never spoke a word. He was smiling at me. Now, when I got to that interview and they began to ask me what to do, how, how, how will I solve problems? What did I do before? Something came on, it, came on me and that is the grace of God. And I began to explain. But I brought out paper and I began to draw. I began to draw. I began to explain to them. This is how this links to this. This is how this links to this. This is how this links to this. This is what I'm going to do here. This is how you should do this. If you want to solve this problem, this is how you should do. I went into that interview. I didn't know what I was going to say. I was afraid because it, it was the highest salary I've, I've ever heard, earned as at that point in time. So I didn't know what to say. I was so afraid. But Christ showed up to me. Grace showed up to me in the, in, in the carriage. And encouraged me. I didn't even know he was encouraging, but I, I knew that as, as I was looking at the face of Jesus in that carriage, is in, in my mind's eye. I was getting calmer and calmer when I got into that interview and I began to speak. The words that I spoke were not my own. It was the words that the Holy Spirit put in my mouth to get a job, and that was escalation. That was elevation. It was the grace of God that elevated me. But one thing I found out is as I brought up papers. And I began to draw the plan, began to draw the schematic of how the whole project should be, should be arranged and, and put together to succeed. I knew it was not me that was doing that. It was the grace of God. And that's exactly what happened to Joseph here. There was no indication in the Bible that when Pharaoh was explaining the dreams to, to Joseph, that Joseph sort of thought, oh, how would, I, how, how would that interpretation come? What do I need to do to solve the problem? And um, um, what, what answers will I give, right, that would nail, nail, this, um, nail these dreams? There was no indication at all like that. Pharaoh gave the, told him the dreams. He interpreted the dreams, but he did not stop there. He began to give answers. He began to put practical plans in place, right, to solve that problem, to take advantage of the abundance that God said was coming, and to help them to ride through the storm of the famine that will come later. And that is grace at work. The grace of God will give you wisdom to know what to say at the right time. You know, Jesus Christ told his disciples, he says that don't, don't prepare when you don't prepare when you are going to go for evangelism. He said, the word that you will speak will be given to you at that same hour. That is grace at work. Grace is our dependence on God. Grace is the ability of God that is at work on our behalf to achieve what we cannot achieve by ourselves. And that requires what? Dependence on God. You know, last week we spoke about humility. We spoke about the fact that humility, a person who is humble, receives more grace from God. 
You know, you can only be humble when you trust God. When you know that God has got your back. When you know that you don't have to perform, you don't have to do this or do that before God can move in your life. So essentially, grace is the ability of God, the supernatural power of God, at work on our behalf to achieve and do what we cannot do by ourselves. That is the power of God at work on your behalf, on my behalf. So which means when you come to the end of yourself, grace is there to lift you up. When you find yourself in a situation where you don't know what to do, grace will give you the wisdom to know what to say in that situation to get you out. And that's why grace is the gift of God to us. You cannot work for it. You cannot earn it. You you have to receive it. And the good thing is, God gave that grace to every believer the very day we became born again. You you cannot even become born again or become saved without the grace of God. The Bible says, by grace, we are saved. It is by grace. It is by this gift of God, this power of God to help us when we were when we when we're in ba- negative zero <laughs> ne- when we're negative below zero it was grace that helped us and took us to the to the to the positive side amen so the bible said what joseph said to pharaoh please uh, pharaoh let's go to verse 38 the bible said so pharaoh said to his servant can we find a man like this a man equal to joseph in whom is in whom is a divine spirit of god joseph pharaoh was saying there's no other person like this guy. Can there be any other person like this guy who has the spirit of God? Which means all the other um, magicians and stuff who were in the kingdom of Pharaoh, they don't have the spirit of God. The spirit of God in Joseph distinguished him from the rest of the crowd. People of God, I want you to know the spirit that you carry the spirit that is on the inside of you is a spirit that's not the same spirit of the world. That spirit, if you learn to listen to the Holy Spirit, if you learn to walk with the Holy Spirit, that spirit will set you apart in anything that you put your hand to do. You will not be like every other person, but you have to learn to walk with the spirit. So today I'm going to be sharing with you uh, the, the message that I've titled Grace, the escalator and the elevator of life or the elevator and the escalator of life and the reason why I, I gave this message i'm going to share with you in a moment because it was a, it was a message that god gave me in 2016 and god spoke to me about this phrase that i'm using with, to, with you today but even then i didn't really understand it right but when you look at the story of joseph you see you can see how joseph was brought from the backwaters of life to the to the to the forefront in one day by what the grace of God, how do we know that is the grace of God? Because God's grace showed Joseph when he was a little boy, when he was at the age of 17 or thereabout. God's grace showed him what his future was going to be like. There was no record anywhere that says Joseph was chosen by God because he was smart. He was beautiful. He was intelligent. He was a hard worker. Uh, He goes to church all the time. There was no inclination. There was no record anywhere. Joseph just had, God just showed him this thing, that this is what your future looked like. So it's exactly like you too. Where you are right now, there are dreams in your heart that God has given to you. Those dreams were placed in you by God. The dreams were there. You didn't work for them. You didn't pray for them. You didn't ask God for them. You didn't beg for them. You didn't have to go to the mountains for them. They were gifts that God gave to you. Because it was a gift that God gave to you. It was a desire of God for you. What God planned for you to achieve in this life. You cannot work for it. Now, what do we do with what we have been given? A gift. We receive it. When you receive that gift, what do you do with the gift? You work with the gift. I hope you understand that now. So, you receive the grace and work with the grace. But you don't Pray and beg to get the to get the gift because the gift was given to you. All you do with a gift is to receive it. Amen. So Joseph became a ruler in Egypt from being um, a prisoner. He became what a premier or a prime minister. The prisoner is now the premier of Egypt. The gift that God gave to Joseph which God gave to him by his grace, was the same object that God used to promote, uh, to promote Joseph. 
the gift that God has given to you. God says, a man's gift, a woman's gift, will do what? We make room for you. The same gift that God has given you is the same gift that God is going to use to open doors for you. Some of you, you've been through certain experiences in life. God didn't bring those nasty experiences for you. But trust me, God is able to use that experience. Those experiences you've had, those nasty experiences, God is able to use them to bring beauty out of ashes for you. You want to know an example of grace? An example of grace is somebody who is an alcoholic, chronic alcoholic, forced into the ditch, oblivious, oblivious of the environment, totally messed up. Then later, when such a person encounters the grace of God, the power of God that changes life, this person becomes what? The owner of a rehabilitation center helping other people. So the person is, is gone through the pain, but it's based on that pain now, God is said, look, from the same place where you have, you, have, you have dined with the pigs, it's the same place, the same place I'm going to make it to become the head of that place. That is grace at work. The Bible says, the grace of our Lord takes people who are a nobody, that people call a nobody, and makes something out of them. If you have experienced this before as well, you, you can relate. You might find somebody that you think you are smarter than. Oh, I'm so smart. I'm smarter than this person. But the person you do something, you're thinking, how is that possible? That is grace at work. Because God does not use us based on how good we think we are. God uses us because of his grace upon our lives. So everything you have received is because of the grace of God. And the Bible says, if you have received it as a gift... Why do you have to boast about it? You cannot boast about something that has been given to you. You can only be what? Be grateful for it. So we see the itinerary of the story of Joseph in this way. Joseph moved from being his papa's boy and he moved to the pit. From the pit, he went into Potiphar's house. From Potiphar's house, he went into the prison. From the prison, he got into the palace. From the palace now, he met Pharaoh. From meeting Pharaoh, what happened to him? He became the prime minister of Egypt. That is a beautiful story. So, at, at his papa's house, Joseph was chosen by God. Not because of anything he's done. It was God qualified him by himself and chose him to be the person through whom he was going to save the whole of his lineage. But the pit, the pit Potiphar's house, the prison, became a place where his, characters, his character was formed. His attitude was built up. His dependence on God was formed, right? So that he can have all the characteristics, traits required for him to succeed when he showed up at the palace and when he became the prime minister. So the experiences of life that you have been through, some of them are engineered to build your character to help you. Some of them are the work of the enemy, which you must rebuke and and resist and reject. But some of them are there to just build your character up. Some of us are saying, oh God, I desire to become a millionaire, millionaire, millionaire. But you don't even know how to manage the thousands that you are getting right now. You don't know how to manage it. If God gives you a million today and you don't know how to manage 1,000 that you, have been, you are receiving, you know what's going to happen? You're going to squander that money. And God, God doesn't want you to, to have that. So there are, characters, there are characters that we need to build on the way to, to the destiny place that we, we require. And that's why we go through certain experiences in life to build character up so that when we get to where God wants us to get to, we are able to sustain and maintain what he has given us. Amen? So, Joseph went through the pit, the Potiphar's house, the prison, in order for his characters to be built and in order for him to acquire the needed needed skills to function successfully as the premier of Egypt. But the same grace that chose him freely is now about to promote him and elevate him in one day. How do we know that? Let's go back to how we know that it was grace that is at work in the life of Joseph. Remember I've explained before that when Joseph interpreted the dreams and gave insight into action plan to solve that dream, so to, to, put, to make the dream uh, a, a, a good thing for them, that was the wisdom of God at play. And that wisdom of God is the grace of God at work in the life of Joseph. I've explained that already. But I want to show you something that Based on that display of wisdom from Joseph, display of the, 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 the going beyond the normal length, not just doing what every employee does, 
doing something different than everybody else doing. That behavior, that, that trait of excellence in, 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 in Joseph, which was premised upon the grace of God upon his life, that, pro- that projected uh, uh, an inference from Pharaoh that I want to draw your attention to. If you go to verse 38, Pharaoh said, can we find a man like this, like this, a man equal to Joseph, in whom is a divine spirit of the God, of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since your God has shown you all this, there's no one as designing and clear-headed and wise as you are. Now, notice something here. When Joseph showed up to Pharaoh in verse 16, Pharaoh, Joseph said, it is not I, it is not in me, O oh Pharaoh, it's not I that will that will, to interpret your dream. I'm not the one that will interpret your dream. God himself will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. That's what Joseph said, all right? In verse 38 here and verse 39, we saw based on the answer, the interpretation of the, interpretation of the dreams, and based on the fact that Joseph was able to put an action plan in place to save the kingdom, the king said, there's no person like Joseph in the whole of the kingdom who has the spirit of God. Which means Joseph acknowledged that the spirit of God in, in a person sets the person apart. I want you to write that down. The spirit of God in a person sets the person apart. The question is, you and I, we do possess the spirit of God. So, if we are not displaying excellence in our work, in our lives, what is the problem? And that is what I'm going to be talking about. So I'm going to be talking about how we can, by the, a way of thinking, even though we have the spirit of excellence on the inside of us, there's a way of thinking that we can embrace that can negate that, that will not make us to enjoy what God wants us to enjoy. So the grace of God was at work for Joseph because Pharaoh said, since your God has shown you all this. Now, Pharaoh was now able to say, the same God has put the spirit of himself upon Joseph. He is the same one who has shown Joseph all of this and shown him how to do it. And he said, there is no one as designing and as clear-headed and as wise as you are. Essentially now, an unbeliever like Pharaoh was glorifying God based on the demonstration of the excellence of Joseph. This is my prayer for you and I, that in the work that we do in the marketplace, in the work that we do in everywhere where we show up, we will be, we'll be people of excellence that will take the spirit of excellence that is in us, who is in us, and will cooperate with that spirit of excellence so that we can produce results, excellent results, that will bring an unbeliever to give glory to God. My mentor, John Maxwell, says something that I find profound. He said, the gift that God has given him, given him is about leadership, building up in the area of leadership. Now, he will get a call from the, king, from the king of Saudi Arabia or from the emir of Dubai to come and teach his staff uh, about leadership. But they will tell him, oh, please, but don't mention Jesus Christ here. Just come and teach us. So he will take the same message, the same thing that is, 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 is put together. He will teach them leadership. He, he didn't mention Jesus, but he's using the same content to talk to them about God. But they knew, listen to me, they knew he is a Christian. They knew the content he's teaching is based on the Christian principle. They didn't want to hear about Jesus, but they are hearing about Jesus regardless, based on the way he packaged the trading. So you can see here now, therefore, that God wants you to be so exemplary in what you do that people that don't know about Jesus when they encounter you, they can encounter the grace called Jesus through the things that you do. My prayer for you and I is that we are going to allow ourselves, we allow God to, 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 to help us to be able to display this exemplary life that he has called us into in the name of Jesus. So, what made Jesus to be, Joseph to be different from the rest of uh, the, 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 the magicians in Egypt? Pharaoh said, Joseph has or had the spirit of God, the divine spirit of God. Essentially, Joseph had an identity that is in Christ. Number two, God showed Joseph the answer. The other magicians, they do not have the answers. So, and that is the grace of God at work in his life because Joseph did not pray for that answer. He did not go to the mountain for that answer. God gave him the answer. The interpretation was given to him 
as the word was being released. Number three, Joseph took this interpretation and went a bit further. He provided a solution to Pharaoh. He was able to use his gift to help other people. So we see here that Joseph's rise to the top is premised on the grace of God that is at work in his life. How do we know this? Because Pharaoh said, since your God has shown you this. Pharaoh now has joined Joseph to give glory back to God. In the sense that the interpretation of this dream is not based on Joseph's knowledge. It's based on what? The God who lives on the inside of him and who has given him the ability, the knowledge to interpret the dreams, to be able to give solution to them. That is grace at work. Grace at work here is God showing the meaning of the dream to Joseph. Now, question I've got for you. Did Joseph do anything to qualify for receiving the help from God? Nothing. So what qualified Joseph? Nothing qualifies Joseph beyond the grace of God. So what is grace? Now, I've got a, a, a scripture here in Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3 verses, verses 4 to 7 says, this scripture describes grace in action. It says this, it says, when the extraordinary compassion of our God, and I, I lighted some words there because I want to pay attention to them. When the extraordinary compassion of God, our Savior, and his overpowering love suddenly appeared in person. Notice, in person. Compassion of God and his overpowering love appeared in the form of a person. That person is who? Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. That person is who? The grace of God at work. The grace of God manifested in the flesh. The Bible says, when this love suddenly appeared in person as the brightness of a dawning day, he came to save us. How? Why did he come to save us? Not because of any virtuous deed that we have done, but only because of his extravagant mercy. So God sent Jesus to show up in person. Grace showed up to save us, not because of the good works we've done, but because of his own extravagant mercy. He saved us, resurrecting us through the washing of rebirth. We are now made completely new by the Holy Spirit, whom he'll splash over us richly by Jesus Christ, the Messiah, our life giver. So as a gift of his love, and since we are faultless innocent before his eyes, we cannot become heirs of all things or because of the overflowing hope of eternal life. This scripture is so beautiful. He's saying this. He's saying this. There's an extraordinary compassion of God. There's an overpowering love of God that is in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this Lord Jesus Christ, who is God in the flesh, full of compassion, full of love, that is both extraordinary and both, uh, both, uh, both is both extraordinary and overpowering. This Jesus saved us because of His extravagant mercy. If you look at the words used, is is words. These are words that are uh, excessive. You know, extraordinary, overpowering, extravagant. Those are the words being used here. He saved us. And the outcome of him saving us is what? We are now new. Completely be made new by the Holy Spirit. This Holy Spirit is splashed over us richly. Splashed richly. Look at those two words. Splashed. When you splash something, you pour something on, on something. Then richly means the quality. So now we have the quantity and the quality of the Holy Spirit. My God, this is so beautiful. The quality and the quantity of the Holy Spirit is already at work in our lives. So, and what does that mean? It means that we are faultless, we are innocent before his eyes. When God sees you, he sees you faultless and innocent before his eyes. Because you are now faultless and innocent before the eyes of God, you have become heirs or heirs of all things. Some things, all things. Health, education, money, ascendancy, whatever it is, you have become heirs of all things. Because you have overflowing hope of eternal life. The words used here are so beautiful, are so extravagant. But I want you to understand something here. This is grace in action. Extraordinary compassion, overflowing love, extravagant mercy, completely new, splash over richly, faultless and innocent, heirs of eternal, heirs of all things, overflowing hope. That is all grace. That is grace at work. So, I define grace as the ever willingness of God to show love, mercy, power, favor, and all good things he has for us. It is the willingness of God to show his love, his mercy, his favor, and all good things he has 
for us grace is a divine help of of god that we receive when we are at our wit's hands grace is god's gift to us grace cannot be worked for grace cannot be uh, cannot be earned grace has to be received grace is the escalator parable son talia that takes us to higher heights of life grace is the elevator that moves us quickly to places we cannot get to ourselves. It was God's grace that helped Joseph, that gave him the right word and the right interpretation and the right action plan to present the solution to Pharaoh. So let's now begin to define escalator and elevator. According to the dictionary, an escalator is a moving staircase consisting of an endlessly circulating belt of steps driven by a motor which conveys people between the floors of a public building. So you have a building, so you have a building, right? You have a building. Uh, let's say you go to a mall. It's just supposed to understand how a, a, what, what an escalator is. You, you go to a mall. And you, let's say the mall has got like four, four floors. They put an escalator. You might see this, the picture on the screen. My, my staff might put the picture on the screen, you know? And you, you go, get on the escalator. You stay there and it just takes you to the next floor. You, you go on to the next escalator. It takes you to the next floor until you get to where you're going. That's an escalator. Okay, what about an elevator? Elevator is defined as a platform or a compartment housed in a shaft for raising and lowering people or things to different levels. And it's, it's a lift essentially. An elevator is a lift. Okay, so when you get into an elevator, you come, the door closes behind you, it takes you to where you need to go. You don't need to even, the, the, the rate of speed of the elevator compared to an ele- uh, escalator is different. It's different. But the beautiful thing, people of God, is that the grace of God is both an elevator and escalator. Now, let's use this analogy. Remember I said, you have the Spirit of God. If Pharaoh can see the Spirit of God in Joseph and say, the Spirit of God in Joseph, Joseph is, was what made Joseph to be able to do what he was able to do under the old covenant. You have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you. You should be able to display the level of excellence even more than Joseph did. Right? That's what we should be. But what is the issue? God told me something which I'm going to share to you in a moment. Just give me five minutes. I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there in a moment. Okay. But grace is an elevator and an escalator. Now, this analogy will help you. Suppose you stand in front of a, of, of a building. You are meant to go to the 70th floor. 70th floor. Right? You're meant to go to the 70th floor. And you have three options. One option is to climb the stairs to get to the 70th floor. Another option is to take the escalator to get to the 70th floor. And the third option is to take the elevator, which is the lift to get to the 70th floor. Which one will you choose? I'm assuming that at least you will not choose number one. You will not choose to take the staircase to go to the 70th floor. Why? Because it's going to take longer. It's going to take longer. It's going to waste your time. You're going to be exhausted as you go along. You're going to become wearisome. So now, here's an amazing truth. When you became born again, the very day you became born again, something happened that God did for you. God elevated you to his own level by the vehicle of grace. But people of God, if you don't know it, you cannot take advantage of it. You are going to behave like somebody who, though has been elevated, see things like he or she is on the ground floor. In the book of Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4 to 6, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 to 6, the Bible says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love, with which he has loved us, even though we were dead in offenses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you are saved. And he raised us up together with Christ and seated us, seated us together with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Now, notice here, it is by grace that you are saved. This same grace, this same power of God, the help of God available to us to help us to do what we cannot do by ourselves, it is by that grace that you have been saved. You have been saved. Now, the Greek rendition of this sentence, by grace you are saved, connotes a perfect tense of both a completed action, you have been saved, and a continual result, you are being saved. Which means that grace is so powerful that not only did it save you, At the time you gave your life to Jesus, it is continuously, grace is continuously saving you today, right now. God is still using the same vehicle of grace to help you, to promote you, to move you forward. But if you look at the outcome of grace here, if you go back to the text, by grace you are saved and he raised us up together and he seated us up together with Christ. So God saved us by grace, but he didn't stop there. He elevated us. He 
escalated us. So, he raised us up. The outcome of grace in your life is elevation. Period. That is the way God sees it. God raised us up together, made us sit together with Christ in the heavenly places. That is our position. So, there's a text I want you to put on the screen. It says, we were escalated, that is raised up, and elevated, that means to be seated, with Christ by God's grace. That is the grace that elevates, the grace that escalates. Grace is an escalator, an elevator of life. Praise God. So, we were escalated, that is we were raised up together with Christ. We were elevated, made to sit together with Christ in the heavenly places. This is your reality. This is your reality. Now, let me tell you this, what I said God told me. In 2016, I was working at a company called Zurich Insurance in London. One day at lunch, I felt led to peep over the atrium and I look at the st- stacks of ele- elevate escalators in the middle of my office. And then I heard the Spirit of God says this to me. He said, my grace is like an escalator. It takes you effortlessly to where you are destined to go. I will say that again. It will be on the screen. My grace is like an escalator. It takes you effortlessly to where you are destined to go. Now, notice the word effortlessly. And notice the word destined to go. The word destined to go. So, destined to go is your destination. Where you are meant to go. The assignment that God has given to you on the earth. Alright? Now, effortlessly means you are not struggling to do it. So, grace acts like an escalator. That makes you not to struggle to fulfill your assignment on the earth. If you are struggling, like the person who is trying to take the staircase to the 70th floor, then you are not walking with grace. You are not embracing the grace of God that God has put upon your life. So, when you step on an an escalator, remember, you don't have to exert any effort for you to take you to where you're going. That's how grace works. Now, if you are walking against the escalator, let's say you are trying to go back or you're trying to get distracted, or you're not standing properly, what will happen? It doesn't work. If you become legalistic in your relationship with God, it doesn't work. If you're walking in the opposite direction, it doesn't work. You are not going to achieve your result as you should. You are going to get delayed. In fact, you can fall, you can hurt yourself, you can affect others as you're trying to climb. So, I want to, over the next 10 minutes, so that I can round up, I want to explain to you how you can you can look at this explanation about the staircase, the staircase, the elevator, and the escalator to understand the grace of God. God told me, my grace is like an escalator. It takes you effortlessly to where you are destined to go. So you, are, you have a destination. Let's go back to the story of you are going to the 70th floor, all right? And you have three options. Take the lift, which is the elevator. Take the escalator. Take the staircase. The destination we're going here is the 70th floor of this building. So, the first step you take, let's say you take the staircase of self-effort. What happened? Suppose you take the stairs. And because you're strong, you believe in yourself, you can handle the bags. You start to carry the bags. Maybe by the time you go to the the 20th floor, now you begin to pant. You stay by to rest. You are frustrated. It seems like life is passing you by. It seems like you are about to give up on life. People of God, if you are depending on your self-effort to get to the very top in life, you could get there eventually, but it will be a life of frustration, exhaustion, loneliness, desperation, and trying to outdo others. That will be a sorry life. This is the life of the believer who is working with God based on the staircase of self-effort. You're just trying to do it by yourself. Okay, let's look at the other one. You decide to take the escalator. I call it the escalator of grace. Now, if you decide to take the escalator, whoo, that's a good one. You have now moved from self-effort. You have moved into what? The life of grace. Now, the life of grace is meant to be what? Based on what God told me, my grace is like an escalator. It takes you effortlessly to where you are destined to go. It's meant to be effortless. But suppose, suppose you, you didn't play the, the way. You got on the escalator quite all right. You stepped on the escalator with your hands holding the handrail. You step on the escalator, you are holding the handrail like this. That is fantastic. This is someone who takes advantages of the grace of God by resting firmly in the provisions of God and trusting in the unshakable character of God. This is how we all start. 
everyone who is born again starts at this level. You step on the escalator of grace, you allow God to take you forward, and God begins to build your character. So when you get to the first landing, you walk to the next escalator, you go and you keep going, your character is being built over time. That's the way God has designed it. That the escalator is meant to take you up. You are just hold the handrail. It takes you up. You don't need to stress yourself. Colossians 2, verse 6 to 8. Colossians 2, 6 to 8 says, As you have therefore received Christ Jesus Lord, walk in him. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Question, how did you receive Jesus? How did you receive Jesus? They told you, Christ died for you. They told you, you can't save yourself. They told you, Christ wants a relationship with you. And they say, and you say, ask them, what do I need to do? Say nothing. You don't need to do anything. Just believe in your heart and receive the gift. You didn't have to pray 25 hours. You didn't have to fast. You didn't have to wake up at 12 midnight to pray. You don't have to do any of this religious stuff that we were told we have to do. You just received it. Colossians 2 here, verse 6 says, the same way you receive Christ, keep walking in him. Now, as you walk in him, walk with him or walk in him, you are going to get rooted. First, you, you get rooted down and God will build you up, built, built in him and God will establish you in the faith. As you have been taught, abandon in it with thanksgiving. So you become, you become somebody who is constantly grateful, constantly being thankful to God for what he's doing in your life. Now, but the problem there happens. The Bible says in verse 8, beware. That is the, the pathway that we all start with. But the Bible says, beware. Lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Bible says it is possible for you to start on the escalator, but you can get cheated. You can be deceived along the way. How? When you begin to follow the baseless need for the for law as a way of regulating behavior, or when you get deceived when you embrace human philosophy, deception, and traditions of men. Human philosophy is when you say, oh, it's okay. Even God, God, God has said some, some things are wrong. You say, no, it's okay. Let's just, let's go with it. I don't want to be somebody that will be, that will be told that um, I'm, 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 I'm politically incorrect. So you begin to bend the, the thought process. What about traditions of men? Well, there are some things we call sake, sake cows of religion. I'm going to talk to you about, about this quickly. You know, For example, you might have heard, somebody says to you, your sin is preventing God from healing you. That can't be right, can it? How many people did Jesus Christ heal when he was here? They were born again. Maybe zero. Actually, zero. There's, there was not one person that Christ healed when he was on the earth that was born again. Because nobody became born again until Christ was raised from the dead. You may have heard, oh, only some of your sins are forgiven because God forgives it in installment. That's a lie. The Bible says Christ saved us and delivered us from all sins. Christ is a propitiation for our sin. Not just for our sin alone, but the sin of the whole world. Propitiation means the satisfaction of wrath. Christ paid for the sins completely. And when did he pay for the sins? 2,000 years ago. The sin you're going to commit today or tomorrow is that not post-2,000 years ago? So that sin has already been paid for. God does not forgive in installment. You may have heard, oh, when you do communion, remember your sins. This one, I was told when I was in church, they told me, oh man, you are still in sin. If you come to communion and you have a sin in your life, better not come. You're gonna get 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 um, you're gonna get um, a sickness in your body. But if you read the scripture that they were quoting in the book of First Corinthians chapter eleven, it wasn't talking about when you come to communion, you should be remembering your sins. He was talking about remember Jesus, remember what He has done for you, remember who you are when you come to communion. If you don't remember who you are when you come to communion, you will mess up your own mind and you open yourself up to what? Diseases. But it's not saying you remember your sins. But religion tells you, unless you do that, when you come to communion, remember your sins. Another one that you may, you may have heard is, if I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven. Uh, truth of the matter is, that statement came from the whole testament when elijah said if i'm a man of god let the god that answers by fire be my god and and fire came down from heaven to consume the sacrifice but you know in the book of john i think about john chapter 7 i think when when the disciple when Jesus was going to, to to jerusalem and he had to pass through syria and they wouldn't allow Jesus to pass through syria 
And the, 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 the disciples asked Jesus and said, Master, should we call down fire like Elijah? Jesus Christ says to them, You do not know the spirit that you carry. The Son of Man has not come to destroy it. You do not know the spirit that you carry, which means that if Elijah were there and to, to try to call fire down from heaven, Jesus Christ is going to rebuke him. So, I call down fire, fire, if I'm a man of God, I call down fire from heaven to consume you. And you scare people with that thing because God has given you anointing. That is sacred cow. So, when you listen to things like this, I've got a lot, a number of them here because of my time, my time, I ran out of my time. If you listen to things like this, and you allow that to, to come into your heart, you are going to be what? Somebody is going to cheat you from what you have already inherited in Christ. So, we have an, a, a, an upcoming conference called the Sacred Cow Conference that me and my, my friend Patrick, um, is, we're going to be running soon. So, watch out for that. But the thing, again, essentially what I'm talking about here with the escalator of grace is when you have come into the escalator, you are holding the handrails. But you can get deceived to not enjoy the escalator of grace if you begin to listen to the traditions of men and the human philosophy of this world. So, even though you are on the escalator, you are not being escalated as you be escalated. Why? Because your mind has been riddled with uh, re- religion. But you are going to church, you are doing everything, but it's not working because your mind is riddled with religion. You have believed a lie. You have believed a lie based on the traditions of men. You have believed a lie based on the human philosophy. Another scenario that could happen, another scenario that could happen here, uh, um, on that the escalator of grace is when... When you choose now to walk backwards on the escalator of grace, what does that mean to walk backwards? Well, the escalator is going up like this, but you choose to walk in the opposite direction. Now, what will happen if you do that? Obviously, that's a stupid decision to make to begin to walk backwards. No, in the in the natural, if you do that, somebody say, "Yeah, this guy, you they ought to get your heads checked if you do that, right?" But people do that. How do you want people to do that? Well, if you begin to eat if you started trusting in God, you put on gone on the escalator and you put your hand on the hand where you rested on God. But all of a sudden, you start thinking, Oh man, I have to live my life based on religion, based on the law, based on that shall not, that shall not, that shall not, that shall not, and use the law to regulate your behavior with God. Then you are walking backwards. If somebody sees you on the escalator walking backwards, somebody will say to you, Dude, where are you going in the opposite direction? That's what they will say to you. Somebody says that to you, you're walking backward on the elevator is going, elevator is, so the escalator is going like this. You're walking backward like this. Somebody says, oh, dude, you're going in the right direction. Why are you doing that? Is everything okay? Of course. If you don't, if you keep going like that, you could fall down, you could trip down, you could delay your own progress. The journey takes longer. You get frustrated. Isn't that right? If somebody walks backward on the escalator of grace, the person has refused to cooperate with the grace of God. And the person goes back to what? Performance-based Christianity as a means to relating to God. Galatians chapter 1 verse 6. Galatians 1 6 says, I am shocked that you are turning away so soon from God who called you to himself through the loving mercy of Christ. You are following a different way that pretends to be the good news. It pretends to be the good news, but it's not the good news. You are following a different direction that pretends to be the good news. So, when we embrace performance-based mindset, we don't rest on the finished work of Jesus Christ. We are trying to help God. We are saying Christ is not enough. We are saying that we must add our efforts in order for us to be right, to be in right standing with God. Galatians chapter 5 verse 4 says this. If you are trying to make yourself right with God by keeping the law, you have been cut off from Christ. You are falling away from God's grace. So it is possible to fall away from the grace of God. When we begin to mix grace and law as a way of relating to God. Finally, as a random, the third option for you is when you choose to go on the elevator, what happens? You step into the elevator, you put the bags in it, the door closes after you. What do you do? You rest and you enjoy the ride. You look out of the view of grace. You enjoy the vista. You are so happy because you are resting in God. What does it mean to rest in God? It means to trust that Christ will come 
through for you regardless. It means to know that your future is hidden in his life. It, 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 it means to know that your life that you have now is the life of Christ. It means to know that God sees you through the lens of Christ. It means to know that God will not do to you what he will not do to Jesus. It means to know that God loves you with an everlasting love. It means to know that you are secured in the love of God. It means to know that you are in that elevator. You are secured. Nothing can touch you. Jesus is the elevator. Jesus is the grace that elevates and is more than enough to take care of you. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 4 verse 10 to 11, the Bible says, For he that is entered into his rest has ceased from his own work as God did from his. Let us therefore labor to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. If you have entered into the elevator called Jesus, if you have entered into the grace that is the elevator called Jesus, and you have rested in that elevator, you can be rest assured that you are going to be going up and going up and going up and going up, everything becomes blissful, everything becomes sweet because Christ is the elevator, but Christ is the grace that carries us. Hallelujah! So, grace is the elevator of life, grace is the escalator of life. If I were to ask you now, as we begin to round up, which of these three scenarios would you like to be a part of? I would suggest that you take the third option, the one I've just called up now. Even if you choose the second option, just make sure you. Hold on to the handrail. The same way you came to Jesus, continue to walk in him. That's all. That's all God is asking for. When we look at the life of Joseph and how God took him from the, from the backwaters of life to become the premier of Egypt, we see that it was God's grace that chose him before anything happened. God chose him when he didn't know what, what's up. And God helped him along the way. God helped him along the way. And then when it was time, God gave him the right word to speak in front of Pharaoh. God gave him the right word to speak in front of Pharaoh and the words, the words were so laden with wisdom and an action plan. And immediately, just one day like that, Joseph became the prime minister. The fulfillment of a long-term dream came to pass just like that in one day. Why? Because God's grace is the elevator. May grace elevate you. May grace elevate you. May grace escalate your life to the, to the forefront. May God, who has already raised, raised you up with Christ, who has, who has seated you with Christ. May that God, with his power of the Holy Spirit, open your eyes even right now to overcome the rudiment thinking of this world, to overcome the religious thinking of this world, to overcome the human philosophy of this world, so that you can take advantage and get to the destination that God has in store for you. Remember what God told me? God said, my grace is like an escalator. It takes you effortlessly to where you are destined to go. When you are resting in Christ, according to that Hebrews chapter 4, when you are resting in Christ, you are not put, putting effort. If you have rested in Christ, you have ceased from your own works. From your own works. You have ceased from working for it. The same way God did for me. But the Bible says there's a bit of work. What work? Labor to enter into that rest. To enter into that rest requires mind renewal requires faith in the impossible God, in the God who does the impossible rather. It requires faith in the God who never fails. The same grace that saved you is available to help you to get to the top. I will say that again. The same grace that saved you when you didn't have to bring anything to the table than just to believe and give you and, and you did your life to Jesus. The same grace is available to help you to get to the top. Remember, you are already seated with Christ. You are already at an elevated position. Just remind yourself on a daily basis. Remind yourself regularly that this is your secure position in Christ. And let your life flow from there. Don't become a human doing, but become a human being. You are a human being. You are meant to embody who God has called you to be. People of God, I want to help you to embed this. Over the next 10 days, starting from tomorrow, I'm going to be running a session called Grace Unleashed. Grace Unleashed, a 10-day Grace Unleashed teaching that I would delve deep into how God's grace can be taken advantage of so that you can live a life that can manifest the elevated life that God has already put you in. You are already seated with Christ. You, you are not trying to sit with Christ. You are already seated with Christ. But how do you take advantage of this secure position that you are in Christ? You need to understand grace. So I'm going to be going through a 10-day Grace Unleashed um, teaching, I'm going to run that in, in the WhatsApp group. So if you want to join, there's a link at the bottom of this uh, video that you can please 
uh, join us from our team will 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 add you to the team the, the the WhatsApp group manually. You cannot join by yourself. You have to fit, click on that link, fill the form, and they will add you, add you manually. And then I'm going to be talking to you over the next ten days. I'm going to be sending you daily message for ten days about how grace can be taken advantage of. Hallelujah. Praise God. I hope that has been a blessing to you. Grace is an escalator. And the grace of God will escalate your life to the top because that's where you already are and will elevate your life to the very top in the name of Jesus Christ. Choose grace. Don't choose law. Choose grace. Don't choose human understanding. Choose grace so that you can walk with the Spirit of God that is already placed on the inside of you. The Bible says that we have received the Spirit of God, not the Spirit of the Word, so that we may uh, understand those things that have been freely given to us by God. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Say with me, Father, today I learned that grace is a gift that you have lavished upon me that manifests in diverse ways. I thank you that Jesus is a gift. Jesus is a gift of grace for me. And he empowers me to rest in him. Father, I pray that your grace will help me secured in Christ, free from destruction, free from religion, but with the awareness of the life that I already have in Jesus. Thank you for helping me. In Jesus' name we pray. People of God, I just want to thank you very much for being part of today's service. Now, a, quick, a, quick, a couple of announcements before we go. We have communion at 3.30. Please make sure you join. It's going to be on Zoom. The link should be on the screen. Um, we would love to have you there. It's the first Sunday of June. I'm just going to be doing some prayers. And I'm going to start teaching about prosperity in the coming weeks. Please watch out for it. It's going to be awesome. You know, because God told us that this is our year of stability and prosperity. Amen. Now, finally, I've got some good news. My very good friend, Patrick Igono, is starting a physical church. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? <laughs> Can you imagine that? So, he's starting a physical church in the town of Milton Keynes. Uh, the address should be on the screen for you to see. I'm going to be talking about this again on Wednesday next week during, during, during uh, midweek service. But please, if you're in the Milton Keynes environment, if you're in that area, go to that church. Listen, you know, Patrick, that God has given the gift to teach about this grace raw. You're going to be getting blessed in that environment so go listen go listen to him right the um and let me see if i got the address here you should have it on the screen but for those of you who are on um who are listening to this on the podcast let me just quickly bring it up for you the address that we are going to be running uh that church my friend patrick is going to be the, uh, the pastor all right but if if there's anyone that i can commit you to as you're listening to this if you live in that area that can teach you the gospel, this is the man. This is the man. I don't listen to a lot of people, but this is the man. This man understands the gospel of Christ. So the address is going to be at Westcroft Pavilion, Cranbourne Avenue, Westcroft Meeting Kings. Westcroft Pavilion, Cranbourne Avenue, Westcroft Meeting Kings, MK4, 4GB. So from next Sunday at 11 o'clock in the morning, you can go there and worship on Sunday. God bless you. Until next time, remember, you are blessed and highly favored.